Good day, everyone. My name is Jessica Poros, and I am the Senior Manager for Education and Outreach at CAQH Core. It's my pleasure you, to welcome you today to our virtual dialogue with Post and Track. In a Q&A fashion, you'll hear about their operating rule implementation and core certification journey. Post and Track helps its customers, which includes health plans, providers, and vendors, optimize the flow of information to maximize efficiency and reduce costs. But before we begin this session, I'd like to mention a few logistical items. You can download a copy of today's presentation from the CAQH.org website. To do so, navigate to the core pull-down menu at the top of the CAQH.org welcome screen and select the core education events page. A link to the PDF version of the presentation can be found under the listing for today's webinar. On this slide, you can see a screenshot of the attendee go to webinar dashboard. You should see something that looks similar to this on the right side of your computer desktop. When joining today's session, it's possible you may have joined the audio portion of the webinar using your computer speakers by default. If possible, we would prefer you to join the webinar audio by telephone. To do this, please select the telephone audio button in the audio panel of your dashboard, and the dial-in information will be displayed. Make sure you enter your audio PIN, which is found under your dial-in information. We will save time at the end of today's program dedicated to responding to audience questions. You're encouraged to submit your questions at any time during this webinar by typing them into the questions panel on your dashboard. We would like to thank our guest speakers for, from Post and Track for joining us today. We will properly introduce them a little later, but want to extend our appreciation to Randy Uloa, Chief Information Officer, as well as Michael Knowles, Vice President of Sales and Customer Engagement, forgive me, at Post and Truck. Today, we will start off with a brief overview of the Phase 1 through 3 CAQH uh, core operating rules, as well as an overview of voluntary core certification. Then we will have Randy give a Post and Truck company profile, followed by, in a Q&A format, uh, talking to our guests about the content how the content and infrastructure operating rules are used in their business, their experience with core certification, and also what they see as the future of healthcare in this rapidly evolving world of changing technology. And we will, of course, have time at the end of the session for your questions and comments. Now, I would like to introduce our first speaker, CAQH Core Associate Director Robert Bowman. Bob? Great. Thanks, Jessica. And just as Jessica mentioned, we do want to just set up a little bit of a preamble here and walk through um, some of the basic requirements for the Phase 1, 2, and 3 core rules and also the voluntary core certification process. So everyone has a firm understanding of that as we delve into our dialogue itself. So um, many of you may know that the ACA mandated specific operating rules and health plan certification um, really through a, a periodic time window, a phased approach, and those phases um, are set by law by the ACA itself. Um, and those different um, requirements for phase one and two, which were health plan eligibility and claim status transactions, um, the compliance date was set January 2013, so already amazingly nearly four years ago. Phase three was the compliance date of 2014 for the EFT and ERA. And phase four is a voluntary set of operating rules that includes claims, referrals, authorizations, enrollment, disenrollment, premium payments. Um, there's also a requirement within the ACA for health plans to go through certification. However, that has only been a proposed rule to date and is not yet mandated. However, um, CAQH Corps always had a voluntary core certification process in place um, to ensure that um, any of the stakeholders that wish to become in compliance and then certify can do that. Um, before we move into the details of that process, let's look next at the CAQH index to get a snapshot of where the industry is um, in adoption of the particular standards. As you can see from the 2015 CAQH index, um, which is the only source that tracks this type of um, information around the adoption of electronic transactions, again, moving away from uh, paper transactions or manual transactions to the fully electronic EDI transactions, um, that are required under HIPAA. For example, um, eligibility and benefit verification has a 70.5% adoption rate. 
Um, so it's actually over a 5% increase from year over year. Uh, so a very significant jump because uh, um, perhaps partially because many entities now um, support the operating rules. It's much easier to engage with providers, clearing houses, um, software vendors with the health plan to ensure that providers receive that very important information and data related to eligibility and benefits. As you can see, claim status increase about a 56.5% adoption rate. Um, it also had a large increase of 6.9% was observed year over year. Um, also, again, very important, uh, claims payment information, 61.4% adoption rate for the EFT transaction. Um, again, this uh, is a, uh, an important indication that the industry, particularly providers, are adopting the EFT transaction rather than processing manually uh, paper checks and running to the bank to make sure that those paper checks are processed. Um, again, adopting the EFT is an important um, administrative simplification transaction and really reduces a lot of burden on the provider, as well as the health plan. The remittance advice is just shy of the 50% mark for adoption. Again, this is the transaction where the remittance advice information and data is related to the provider on how the claims were adjudicated by the health plan. Again, uh, a, a nearly a 5% point increase in adoption year over year for the remittance advice transaction, which is, again, another significant indicator that the industry is moving towards adoption of this very helpful transaction as well. If we move on to the next slide, you'll see that um, CAQH Core um, does have very specific requirements for each of the transactions. Most of these are based on phase. So for phase one eligibility, um, we included very specific data content requirements as well as infrastructure to ensure that the, the roadway, the pathway, from a provider to a health plan is easy, clear, in real time, um, 20 seconds or less. There's connectivity via the internet um, to ensure that the provider can submit the eligibility inquiry and receive the response back with very specific information. This includes health plan names and coverage dates, as well as static financials, copayment, coinsurance, deductible, Benefits specific deductibles for individual or family, um, you know, dependent information as well is all included in there. Um, phase two it also included um, addition of the claim status transaction uh, for infrastructure requirements. Again, related to real time and batch uh, connectivity, um, companion guides, the flow and format of the information in the companion guide, system availability. So really allow, lay the foundation to conduct both of these transactions. Now moving on to the next slide for phase three. Um, we see that for phase three we include the EFT transaction and the 835 or the ERA transaction. And this is in, to ensure faster payment and more accurate reconciliation, more speedy <laughs> reconciliation as well. Um, now for data content, the phase three rule includes the uniform use of the CARTs and RARTs. These are the codes that are used by health plans to um, provide a message to the provider in detailing how that claim was adjudicated. Now the rule identifies a minimum set of four business scenarios and the, within those business scenarios there's a maximum set of codes. So now all the health plans across the country are using a uniform set of codes to respond to a provider's bill or claim by line or by claim itself um, for, determine, for um, relating exactly how the, that particular line or claim was adjudicated and what the message back to the provider was. Why was there an adjustment? Why was there a denial? I'm going to make it much easier for providers to process that information both um, automatically by auto-posting that information to their accounts receivable and better understanding the reasons why there, those adjustments were made. The rule also included the infrastructure for the transaction for the 835, again allowing for ease of, the, um, ease of conducting the transaction from the health plan to the provider um, along the lines of a companion guide and connectivity and acknowledgments as well as um, the EFT ERA reassociation allows for the information to be included um, related to the CCD plus transaction, the EFT transaction within the 835 so that the provider can better marry these two transactions because they do come from two different um, 
entities to the provider because it's a the EFT transaction is a bank to bank transaction and the 835 transaction the provider has the ability to retrieve that from the health plan directly or from uh, an intermediary that may exist between the provider and the health plan. There's also very specific rule requirements around the EFT and ERA enrollment. There's a data rule and a requirement for health plans to support electronic enrollment for these transactions. So easing the way for providers to request these transactions and then start to receive them and process them all electronically, allowing for easier, much quicker auto posting of the data and the EFT payments into their AR. We can move on to the next slide. And we're going to move our, to our next topic and talk about the core certification process. And the core certification process, as I mentioned earlier, has always been a part of CA2H core since its foundation in 2006 with phase one. Um, and it really is a certification process that was built by the industry for the industry. So it, it makes sure that an independent um, uh, process is in place and there's an independent entity that conducts the test scripts for you. You basically set up a profile and they'll conduct the testing uh, on your on the behalf of, of you. They'll val validate your transactions. Um, so again, it's was very much um, in, very important for CAQH core members to ensure that um, the requirements were developed by a broad multi-stakeholder um, industry representation, um, a very transparent process. Um, lots of polling was taking place to ensure that everyone had a say and everyone had a vote in what that should look like. It does require conformance testing by a third-party vendor that are experts in EDI and testing. So it is conformance testing. It's not a really super robust end-to-end -end test for every little nuance within your system or application, but it does can ensure that you're meeting all of the specific requirements for your stakeholder type. CAQH Core serves as a neutral, non-commercial administrator. We will review the results of the testing. There's testing reports are generated, and we review the, the contents to ensure that um, both the, the testing a agent as well as the tester, or the testee, um, is making sure that um, everything flows through, um, that there's no questions about compliance or conformance with the testing uh, results. Um, and we do that prior to issuing the core seal. If we move on to the next slide, we'll see that um, there's a variety of entities um, that can become core certified and have become core certified. Um, we've issued nearly 300 certification seals, both for health plan stakeholder types, providers, clearinghouses, and vendor solutions or products. And all the different subtypes can also become core certified. And you'll see that um, throughout uh, the presentation today, as well as on our website, we issue, we've issued seals to a number of organizations. On the next slide, you see some of those actual examples from health plans, um, from small local regional plans, like the San Francisco Health Plan, to large multi-payer uh, systems that are national and broad. Uh, we have providers from the Department of Veterans Affairs to Mayo Clinic to Wake Forest um, to clearinghouses like uh, Trizetto, Post and Track, our featured speaker today, and Optima and Change Health. So again, from small, large, regional, um, you name it, it runs the gamut. Um, vendor solutions, many of the providers look for their vendor solutions. We ensure that we work with um, the vast majority of the, the ones that providers really need to, to, to use uh, because they have such a large footprint within the marketplace. Um, if we can move to slide, uh, the next slide, we can see that there are some key benefits for each of the stakeholder types in pursuing voluntary course certification. Health plans can ensure that they are conducting the transactions, the HIPAA required transactions, um, in a secure, timely, and streamlined electronic process. Uh, it demonstrates conformance that they are actually in uh, uh, meeting the requirements of the federally mandated operating rules and also the standards that underlie those. Um, it shows that they are maximizing the efficiencies of the operating rules and the underlying standards. For providers, it eliminates um, a lot of manual processes, both from uh, picking calling to uh, provider centers at health plans as well as all the manual um, uh, clicks that providers have to do on a uh, health plan web portal. If they can auto post and receive the information directly either for 
um, the eligibility transaction. There's no need to call if they receive the data that they need to make that business process transaction with the member or with the member's um, AR. Again, it increases patient satisfaction because it, it makes it much easier for, that, for the provider to have that business interaction with their member. Again, it shows that you are maximizing the efficiencies afforded by the operating rules and the standards. For clearinghouses and vendors, definitely um, something that we've seen quite a bit. Um, as soon as uh, a vendor or a clearinghouse has obtained the core certification seal, they are very happy and quick to post that seal notification on their website. Again, it adds value for their customers and attracts new customers. Um, core certification has become basically a trading partner contract of expectations. You know, the roles and responsibilities are, are well known between um, those entities that are core certified and they know exactly what to expect and make sure that their systems and services and products um, meet those operating rules and standards. Now if we can go on to um, the next slide, we'll move into our first polling question. So I'll hand the call back over to Drew. Drew? Great. Thank you very much, Bob. And this brings us to our first of three polling questions this webinar. And uh, the way this will work is I will read the poll and then you will see on your screen uh, pop up uh, a window where you'll be able to uh, log your results or your, uh, your choices there. So I will read the question and then I'll launch the poll and we'll pause for just a brief moment. So this question asks, which of the currently mandated CAQH core operating rules has your organization implemented? And this is a multiple answer uh, uh, question. So check all that apply. And this is phase one eligibility, phase two eligibility and claim status, phase three EFT and ERA, uh, uh, none or not applicable or don't know. So we'll pause for just a brief moment, uh, maybe about 15 seconds for uh, everyone in attendance to log their choices. And um, Bob and Jessica and whoever else, I might ask for uh, some feedback based on, on the results. Take about two more seconds here. You see 71% of the attendees have logged their vote. All right. Well, close the poll and I'll share the results. So Bob, you can see here that 51% uh, of those that uh, logged uh, responses indicate that it's, and, it's, and I should clarify, it could be any combination. I won't know until we pull the, the exact number, but quick, quick um, percentages here. 51% say that it's phase three, 53% say phase two, 40% say phase one, uh, 15 percent say none, and 30 percent say I don't know. And again, there, there could be some combination, but we'll have to look at that on the back end. But what, what do you make of these results? I think it shows that um, the industry has a high adoption rate for either supporting the transaction as a health plan, many of the health plans are required, but also many vendors and clearinghouses support the transactions and have a large client base for the eligibility and the ERA transaction. It may be a little bit smaller for claim status. Um, some uh, software vendors do not participate in that transaction or don't have a product offering for that, whereas others do. And also the EFT, um, many folks uh, that is outsourced to strictly uh, the bank to bank transaction. So the health plans support the transaction, but um, many vendors may not directly support that. Uh, so very interesting stats, and we'll definitely make sure we can pull these together. Um, so yeah. I'll hand the call back over to you. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for that insight. And so we will now, now we're going to move on to our speakers today. And I would like to first introduce our two speakers from Post and Track. Uh, first, I would like to uh, introduce Randy Loa, who is the Chief Information Officer and has overall responsibility for technology services, vision, and strategy. He has been instrumental in leading all of the key IT initiatives since October 2002 from product development to system modernization, including IT applications, change and quality management, information security, enterprise architecture, service delivery, and informatics. Mr. Ulloa has worked for over 20 years in the information technology arena, with more than 15 of those years in healthcare senior leadership positions. Prior to Post and Track, he held several uh, senior 
developmental positions, uh, a senior developer and architect lead positions uh, with then retailer Ames Department Stores from 1998 to 2002, and was most recently supporting over 450 stores nationwide. Our second speaker is Michael Knowles, Vice President of Sales and Customer Engagement, and Mike has over 20 years of healthcare sales, marketing, and business development experience. At Post and Track, he leads the company's sales efforts to payers for their EDI and clinical data integration solutions. Mike is active with, w, with Weedy, CAQH, and HIMS. Prior to Post and Track, Mike held positions at the Morales Company and Novamed Corporation. And now, Randy, we will give uh, Post and Track a company profile. Welcome, Randy. Thank you, uh, and thanks everybody for joining today. This is actually Mike who's going to give the company profile, so I apologize. But I, the first announcement we wanted to make is Post and Track is now P&T uh, data. And I'll explain why on the next slide. Post and Track data, or P&T data, is, is a software solution that our customers use to deploy out to all of their submitters of data. And what we found over the years, especially in our early years, that you know 90% of our data was EDI, but in the last three years, uh, it's really it's really shifted in that you know it's probably 50-50 between administrative and clinical data. And our payers, who are our customers, and we work with some of the largest payers in the U.S., where we reach out and we gather a fair amount of that administrative data, but we're also seeing a lot of that uh, clinical data. Uh, be required as well, especially um, uh, as, as we start to move towards more value reimbursement where the convergence of administrative and clinical data is really starting to take place. And on their behalf, we're reaching out to labs and vendors and providers and hospitals throughout the U.S. to get that data, to bring it in to the, to the, to the healthcare payer in a compliant and usable fashion. Uh, I think, um, uh, you know, it's important to know we've been in business for 11 plus years now, uh, great growth and success. Uh, we were named the Gardner Cool Vendor in 2015, as well as uh, their hype cycle uh, 2015 and 16 for clinical data integration. And we are uh, proud to say that we're uh, not only ENAC accredited, but we're core uh, phase one, two, and three certified in, in looking at the, uh, the phase four uh, voluntary certification at this point. Uh, so on the next slide, it really tells you a little bit about that you know, why, why we've changed our name to PNT Data. Because really everything in healthcare starts data. And, and the one thing I think we all can agree on is that whatever data we need today, we're going to need more of it tomorrow. And as the models change with the ACA, the need to share data between health plan and hospital, health plan and ACO, ACO to hospital, physician uh, to lab, and there's just a fair amount of need for that data, and there's numerous sources, there's fundamental disparity, there's limited transparency, poor quality, you have a lot of different standards and formats that still exist out there, and even though the ANSI's, ANSI standards have been developed, we do see some content variations across the board. And then anyone who's working with the clinical HL7 formats know that though there really is no published standard. So we like to think we solve this data chaos that exists. And, and we really do four things that are really illustrated on the next slide. We, t we take that data and we connect. Uh, we have an agnostic approach to connecting to all of the submitters of a various health plan so that we can reconcile and organize that data so that they can share it across the enterprise in a, in a very compliant and usable fashion. And it's just a secure, scalable, and reliable platform, like I mentioned, that is ENAC accredited. Um, it allows us to work and solve a lot of that many-to-one and one-to-many issue that exists between the health plan and their constituents. And um, uh, thanks, and that was uh, just a quick overview, and we'll get into more details about what Post and Track is doing in the virtual dialogue. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. Um, so once again, this is Jessica Poros, and I'm going to be moderating uh, this next portion of the webinar, um, where we're going to have a little bit of an you know, a interactive conversation. And I'm so excited to be talking to Randy as well as Mike from PNT Data in a little more detail. Um, we're also jo joined by Bob Bowman from CORE. So let's begin. Um, so the first question um, is for Randy. Um, would you describe your operating rule implementation journey? You know, what challenges did your organization face during implementation? Were there any transactions that were more challenging than others? Sure. Um, sure. Sure. And thank you for having us here today. So, 
our journey began in about 2007, and, and really the way the story shaped up was we uh, had been on a customer engagement where they had a requirement for um, posting track to become core certified. So at that time, that came on the heels of just becoming ENAC certified and 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 SOC, excuse me, and SAS 70 certified, which is you know a precursor to SOC and high trust. So we were pretty much certified out at that point in time. So as we started to learn more about CAQH and core, we realized this wasn't you know one of the standard certification processes that we've been through and we start to really understand how it aligned to where the industry was going overall. So once we uh, became well versed in the process, it was a seamless uh, engagement and it really it really just followed a standard project model from um, you know your, your agile best practices um, through to um, through to from the pledging uh, to testing the final certification and ultimately the post seal um, the post certification and the seal um, uh, delivery so everything was well laid out and well defined by CAQH uh, core and we found that there were a number of points of contacts along the way that helped um, assist us as you know this was our first process and first uh, uh, foray into the um, core cycles, and we've obviously been through um, several subsequent cycles since, and are engaged in our phase four, as Mike um, highlighted uh, just a moment ago. And you know, I think the biggest challenge that we found initially um, was how could we best align the core goals to our business drivers? Because at the time, there was there wasn't a mandate for any organization to really become. Um, CAQH course certified that didn't come till after. This was more of an elective process. So we had to make sure that our business stakeholders were also well versed with the process and understood why we were um, you know, aligning our, our business goals and our technology strategies toward these drivers. That, that's uh, great to hear and you know it's always uh, good to hear that you know we're kind of doing okay to to serve you and, and you know help um, all of our customers in their implementation journey. I just want to clarify that you know certification, the operating rules are mandated. Certification is voluntary, but as Bob has already explained, you know it's you know a, a, it's a good way to make sure that you're you're doing the implementation the right way. Uh, my next question um, for Randy is, you know, you've mentioned that you had a project management model and it was all pretty straightforward, but was there a learning curve when the Affordable Care Act came out and the operating rule requirements were mandated in 2013 sure. and 2014? Sure. So, you know, we had already been a member of X12. Pro. So from a transaction set perspective, we were well versed with all the um, defined transactions that CAQH Core touches upon. So we were already experts in that, in that space on those administrative transactions. Um, but what we found was as the ACA came into effect and, and the essential health benefits hit, we truly need to become versed, more versed in the um, content variances that our customers started to display. So, you know, from one health plan to the next, we started to see disparity in, in the content and how they were trying to address the essential health benefits and, and, and things like accumulators and, uh, and the like. Um, deductibles, coinsurances, and how those accumulators applied. So we had to understand on a case-by-case -case basis or health plan on by health plan basis how each one were uh, effectively applying those within these messages, and then how could we convey that information, make it interoperable with our endpoint customers, our end users, and ensure that there was a smooth transition. So um, you know, we post and TNT data is predominantly a conduit, but we're also a, uh, adv an advisor on the on the data itself, so that when our when our end users have questions, that we coordinate and facilitate the um, delivery of information back and forth and the understanding of said information. So that's that's really um, interesting, and also you know, kind of combined with what Mike was saying earlier about the importance of you know, kind of this data data puzzle that you guys help people put together. Um, you know, it really helps to present a really good picture. Um, but you know, in order to get an idea of the scale of your company, 
Um, can you give us a little bit of information about the volume of the transactions that you process? Um, sure. Sure. So we, we've seen a healthy growth in our volume over the years, and our current uh, statistics run such that we process in excess of 25 million eligibility transactions per month on average, um, over 2.5 million uh, claim status transactions per month on average, and in excess of 7 million um, claim level payments uh, monthly. Wow. That is not too shabby. That is uh, incredible. Um, very, very large numbers. Um, I'd like to, um, you know, change my line of questioning a little bit and ask a question to Mike. Um, so congratulations on being named a cool vendor in Gardner's Cool Vendors in Healthcare Payers uh, 2015 report. So what does that designation mean to you guys? Well, I, I think it, it was really an honor to be named um, a cool vendor for healthcare because Gartner really looks out uh, at the vendor marketplace and really looks for those innovative and compelling vendors that that health plans should take a look at for their data needs. And so, being named that and you know achieving that in the hype cycle for data integration, clinical data integration for 15 and 16, is, is really an endorsement of of why we moved the the name to PNT Data. And, and how all of those functions and features that we did for the administrative transactions really ap uh, apply across the data spectrum within, within the health plans. Um, that, that makes sense. And, you know, um, it, congratulations again. You know, you've just gone through this process of kind of reinventing and rebranding yourselves as PNT data. So given that, how do you see yourselves evolving in the next two to three years, and what other issues in healthcare administration do you think you'll be tackling? So we, we really see sort of in the, in the future, we see a convergence between those clinical and EDI transactions. And, you know, one of the things we really loud uh, core for was their ability through the operating rules to not only make the transactions compliant, but really useful. And, and as we go forward, and probably the best example, when you start thinking about the referral and auth transaction, there's really an underlying clinical component uh, for that transaction to work and be useful where a, a client requests an authorization, a health plan requests more, more information, and that's, a, that's going to be of the clinical variety, whether it's a CDA, uh, whether it's using the fire protocol, whether it's using CCD information or even unstructured data, and that's going to be embedded within an EDI transaction. So you're, you're really going to see that start to evolve, and we see the marketplace, and, and we see uh, PNT data uh, really evolving and, and really taking advantage of that space um, and, and managing a lot of that data for our health plans over the next two to three years. And our, our EDI um, volume is about 500 million transactions a year, and, and in the last three years, our clinical volume is, is at least that, if not more. Uh, so we see our data footprint evolving as well. So, so we really are handling and processing and managing data on behalf of our health plans and their customers uh, on a grand scale, and, and, and we're really poised to see that grow. But we're, we're poised to see how, how those two intersect and provide a, a real meaningful result to them around value-based reimbursement in the management and the health status of their membership. Uh, that's, you know, fascinating. and. Um my colleague Bob, you know, I, I feel like some of the themes that you just uh, mentioned or some of the key terms that you just mentioned in your last response are things that Bob, you know, I hear Bob talk about. Um, so Bob, do you see any parallel uh, between the, you know, this evolution that PNT data is going through and CORE's mission and work, especially looking forward? Yes, I definitely think there's a, a a great parallel between the work that Mike just um, mentioned that uh, PNG data is going through over the last couple of years and what to expect in the next couple of years, especially when it comes to data. Um, and with the uh, clinical administrative data becoming more and more important, especially for very specific uh, decisions that have to be made um, as providers, vendors, clearinghouses, and health plans look at what's coming next. And that's going to be really important. Um, Mike mentioned uh, prior authorization, that kind of combination of an administrative transaction and the clinical data. That's going to be something that CHQH Core is going to be looking at as well this year and into next year on how can we, now that we've developed phase four and laid the groundwork for the foundation of 
uh, you know, very specific uh, requirements for the prior authorization. We, you know, we have all of the infrastructure requirements laid out, the connectivity, um, acknowledgments, um, how to conduct a transaction in real time and batch, and what that looks like and what that means. And now we can take a, a step back and prepare and look for what's the best way now to look at the data content requirements of the transaction. Um, the attachment requirements for the transaction. What do health plans need for attachments for the prior authorization of the referral? What are they looking for? What's the best next steps for the industry when it comes to the data content of the transactions? And making sure that both the providers can supply the data and health plans can process that data in a meaningful way that's really a win-win for both sides of that transaction. Um, and the vendors and the clearinghouses in the middle are going to be the, you know, the solutions. And so they're going to be really at the forefront to making sure that what the providers need and what the health plans need, they can um, deliver that. So it's going to be really important for entities just like PNT Data to be part of that process. And so that's why we also commend them for being uh, core participants, being part of that process as we develop that out over the next year. Well, absolutely. It feels like, you know, listening to um, Randy and Mike uh, speak and you that it seems like we're all uh, going in the in the same direction um, and have the same goals and priorities. Um, my next few questions are going to uh, be focused on voluntary course certification. Um, and the next uh, two questions are for Randy. Um, so Randy, um, when you, you know, went through your process to decide to course certify, um, you know, what were you thinking? You know, why did uh, PNT data choose to become core certified? Sure. So, so as I mentioned initially, it started with a customer engagement where there was a, somewhat of a requirement. But since then, you know, we showed a slide earlier in this presentation that spoke about um, the initiatives in healthcare starting with data. And, and there's a significant amount of data chaos happening within the industry. And things like connectivity issues and compliance mandates um, the various standards, disparate formats, um, changing requirements, and so on and so forth. You know, we find that core helps drive toward a, a level of a. You know, once once folks adopt this, they drive toward a level of standardization, and that standardization is in complete alignment with our goals and our overall goals and, and business drivers, which ultimately will yield you know, cost control and process control for everyone involved. So administrative simplification becomes a reality and, and, and the control of, of, of how much it's going to cost everybody to do business with one another becomes, you know, becomes more tangible and, and, and measurable. Um, so um, Randy, a little bit earlier you were talking about you know, some of the challenges you experienced. Um, Specific to court certification, and since there are probably some folks in the audience that are kind of thinking about certification, um, you know, what would you say to them? You know, what were some of the challenges or lessons that you that you and Mike went through um, while you were going through certification? Yeah. So, so again, I would treat it as you would treat any other project, you'd have your, you know, you'd have your appropriate resources designated for this, for this process from your PM to your BA to your, you know, whether it be developer, your QA and, and or your EDI analysts. Get them involved, get them to understand the importance. Also get your, get your business folks involved with the process because once you have those, those stakeholders, um, you know, assisting with the, with sponsoring the overall initiative, you're going to find that it's going to move along much more swiftly than it would in the past. You give yourself an ample amount of time. You know, the core. Once you go to begin the process, you you know go through the pledging cycles. You have generally a year to uh, execute on that, which is you know it's more than enough time. And then look to. Um, Look to use other tools to assist with the process. So the, the, your testing vendor, they do a great job, but there are other tools that you can use that we found very helpful, um, third-party tools like SOAP UI or, or Telerix Fiddler, which, which help our, helped our team investigate at the protocol levels what may be happening with the transactions and why you know, a multi-part MIME format wasn't being accepted or passing the uh, testing cycle. So, Making sure that they're versed in, in, in third-party tools will help expedite the process. And then once you um, you know create the once you've completed the first cycle and first 
phases, you can use those for subsequent phases downstream. So keep those test beds available, keep those project plans available, because we utilize those artifacts for our subsequent testing. And, and you know, and just as recently as, as, as phase four, we're pulling our phase three project plans uh, to build out our phase four project plans. You know, that is really helpful, and they're really tangible, concrete steps that you took that I think will be helpful uh, to the folks that are listening. Um, Bob, from, you know, from more of a core perspective, you know, what can we tell our, you know, listeners how, um, that maybe are experiencing challenges or thinking about core certifying? You know, what, what should they do and how can we help them? Randy mentioned, um, uh, or tangentially mentioned the resources, and, and those can be really helpful for people as they uh, key up any sort of IT project. And we have set up on the core website all free, all this information, all the data, all the templates are free and available to anyone that wishes to access them. We have a very specific analysis and planning guides that are you know, spreadsheets. And these are things that you would give to your uh, technical team members, your business analysts, and they will go through and interview their systems. And they'll determine exactly where the gaps are for those systems to ensure that the remediation project that needs to be launched can be effectively scoped. Um, it could be, uh, you, you'll know exactly what sort of uh, technical components are missing that need to be added or business processes that need to be added. And you can actually develop your project plan um, from that gap analysis. So it's really important um, that, uh, and we've been pounding the payment to make sure that the industry knows that these resources are available. They're available by phase. So there's a phase one, a phase two, a phase three, and now a phase four gap analysis tool. There's over 700 FAQs and all of these um, frequently asked questions. They've all really originated from people sending in emails to our help desk uh, email box and asking questions. Well, what's the interpretation of this? We see it as this, and it, we think it's this, but are, we want to confirm that. So we've confirmed all of those types of inquiries through our FAQ development process. Um, and so those are all publicly available for free on our website to help you through your implementation project. Um, to ensure that you get it right the first time and you don't have to go back and, and rework something because um, no one likes to do that in projects. Um, no one likes scope creep and no one likes to add requirements after you've already approved and funded a project and it's launched. So we want to make sure that um, we get it right the first time. So lots of resources are available free at our website to make sure that um, you can launch those projects uh, effectively. That's very helpful, and um, you know how to contact us by email or phone if there's anything we can do to help. Um, the next three or four questions, you know, I'd like to kind of, you know, you think a little bit high high level, um, if, you know, kind of about, you know, health the future of healthcare. Um, so, um, Mike, um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about healthcare administration and the transformation it's going through. So, for PNC data. Um, what do you see as your main opportunities and challenges that you're going to be facing now and in the near future? And how are you going to address them? Well, I think um, it all comes back to data. Uh, with value-based reimbursement coming in, the health plans are going to really need to be able to prove that they're improving the health status of their, uh, their membership. And the claims data, which is sort of the after the fact, uh, you know, a claim has occurred, a patient is sick. You really need to marry that with some of the some of the clinical information and and to prove uh, you're lowering readmission rates and, and all of those measures that are that are out there. But but I think the big challenge is there's fundamental disparities in the data types and and that's where I think standards come in. Um, one of the things that I think is important is that it, you know compliance is one part of of standards maintenance. But but I think some of the things that Core has done, which we will hope to see to continue on the other transaction sets is requiring business rules that make, make those transactions useful. If you're going to drive adoption, compliance uh, gets people to do it, but, but usefulness gets them to continue to use it and have it evolve so that it's meaningful every, for everybody in the process. So I think Post and Track is uniquely poised to work with the health plans to gather all those types of data and to really help uh, bridge that fundamental disparity so that the, the data gets to the right place at the right time uh, with the right content. So I think you're right, Mike. I think the, the data is the key. Um, so Bob, um, how do you see, you know, 
what core does and you know you know how a national set of business rules um, fit into what Mike has just described. You know, it's a, it's really important, and it's um, as we've seen with the previous phases that. Uh, you know, the standards have been around for a long time and it's taken, you know, regulation to ensure that entities implement just the standards. And now we've had that same um, regulatory impulse to, uh, for the operating rules to ensure that uh, they're also implemented. But remember, CORE started back in 2006, long before the requirements to adopt the operating rules and the industry saw huge, significant gains um, once they implemented the operating rules on a voluntary basis. And that's what kind of drove the rest of the market um, to adopt the operating rules through regulation because they were so beneficial. I think we'll see that continued only not only with phase four, but um, any future phase of operating rules, you know, again, as, as Mike mentioned and, and Randy too, with value-based payments coming, a very important model shift. Uh, we're going to have to have not only the standards, you know, if it's a claim or if it's the remit um, or if other standards are available uh, to help um, monetize and understand that business process. We also will have to have uh, operating rules to help ensure that whatever standards those are that regulate or um, can ease that business function of monitoring value-based payments, uh, operating rules have to be, have their very significant position as well in that model. Um, also with prior authorizations, as, we, as I mentioned, um, we now have the infrastructure, but now we'll have to look at the data content. Um, and the data content's expanded with attachments. A again, looking for um, specific uh, standards, you know, whatever those may be, and there may be more than one for um, attachments. Uh, we need to look and see and ensure that the data content and the operating rules uh, work together hand in hand to ensure that the business process Again, remember, all of these standards and operating rules are to ensure that the specific business function and process um, is eased and make it less manual, um, reduce the cost. So just as Randy Mike said, um, looking at the operating rules are going to have to have to be uh, part of that process as we move forward, and we're looking for core participants to be part of that process as we develop those out. That's great. Um, so our, uh, my next question is for Mike. Um, you know, so what do you see are the major trends uh, in terms of how technology is affecting the healthcare industry and how does that affect data management and, and also the effect on the user experience? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think really what we see is that there needs to be great transparency and, and the data needs to get to folks who need it in a very timely fashion. And I think the technology is really breaking down a lot of barriers to the old paper-based systems. Uh, but paramount to that is if you're going to break down those barriers and provide transparency, the answers need to be correct. Uh, so there's there's an element of data quality uh, that I think uh, we see coming in. So not only do you need to make sure that um, you move the data by who, by where, but you get it to the right person uh, with the right content, then the answer's got to be correct. No, that's that, that's a, a really good point, um, and you know that because I when you were talking about that, I was thinking about you know personal information of the data. So that that leads me to my next and final question, which is that healthcare is becoming more patient and person centered, um, and looking beyond traditional healthcare topics. Um, so what does this mean for a company like PNC Data? Well, I think we see, and, and, and we've already been exploring this from a use case perspective, is that the consumer's taking a, a larger control of their uh, of their health, and there's there's wearables, and there's all kinds of data that might be relevant that are coming from the wearables, the Apple Watch, the Fitbit of the world, and, and and what have you, you know, ingestibles, and and even some of the, the medical devices can can report out um, critical health metrics in real time, and what have you. So. So you're really going to have to reach down to the patient uh, in the future and then those same data uh, elements and governance policies exist because you, it's got to be quality data. Uh, you have to make sure you protect it and you have to deliver it to folks that are allowed to use it. Uh, and, and so, so we see that data footprint growing. Randy? Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo that, Mike. It, it, all, these, all the technical innovations that are happening on a near daily basis, they're driving change every day. 
we're seeing large quantities, vast lakes of, of, of data volumes just, just hitting us from every angle. And that's only going to increase. Um, you know, we add on the Internet of Things, as Mike talked about, ingestibles, wearables, embeddables, and so on and so forth. There's going to be more and more format disparity and, 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 and the like. And, you know, Post and Track is very poised to address those, those particular issues and um, adapt very quickly with those changes. So, yeah, change will drive um, opportunity for Post and Track. Well, uh, absolutely. And, you know, you have a, a great challenge. Um, because uh, this data is getting bigger, um, but it's also a big responsibility. But um, we know that you are up to the challenge. Um, so that leads me to the end of this segment, and I want to thank either the three of you, Bob, Mike, and Randy, for your time, uh, taking the time to talk to us and share uh, your experience and your knowledge with us. Um, and now I am going to send it to Drew for two more polling questions. Thank you, uh, Jessica, and thanks, uh, you guys, for the, uh, the great discussion. And this brings us to our second uh, polling question. Uh, and just like last time, I will read the question, and then we'll pause very briefly uh, for everyone to answer. And this question uh, asks, do you anticipate that your, co that your organization will become core certified in 2016? And I will launch the poll. And this can be any kind of certification. Yes, either phase, one, two, three. Or four. And four, which yeah. is launching very shortly. Mm -hmm. It'll take about five more seconds. And Jessica or Bob, I might throw it to you just a brief comment before we move on to our sec our our third poll. So two more seconds, log your results, and I'll share the results. So I'll close it out and share the results with everybody. Uh, we have a tie for unsure or no at 28 percent. 21 indicate that they are already core certified, followed by a tie at 12 percent for yes or not applicable to their stakeholder type. And, and Bob or Jessica, what can you make of these results? I think it's uh, great news that we definitely have some of the participants on the call today that will be pursuing course certification. Um, just a reminder, we have a lot of resources available on our website for you. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to reach out to us and we'll support you as much as we can. Yeah, and then for the 28% the of you that are unsure, um, we do have uh, core certification webinars uh, that are specific to core certification coming up, so hopefully you will join us. Absolutely. And then our third and final uh, polling question of the webinar, uh, this one asks, uh, which of the following was the biggest challenge to your organization's implementation of the CAQH core operating rules? And again, this is any of the phases that might be applicable to, to you. So we'll launch this poll. And again, just pause for a brief moment for everyone to respond. And this is a single answer only. It's not a multiple choice. So just select uh, maybe the most applicable that, that you can think of. And this, uh, the, your answers will help us serve you better in the future if there were one of these with a particular challenge. Yes, yeah, so and, and this, we've asked this question many times, and it's because we use the results to uh, help craft new tools and resources. It'll take about three more seconds. All right. We'll close the poll and share the results. Largest percent, 41 percent, saying overcoming resource constraints followed by 27% saying fully understanding the operating rules, and then 14% uh, saying did not encounter any challenges, that's good to see, 11% saying working and testing with training partners, and 8% saying identifying and completing necessary system updates. Bob or Jessica, any thoughts before we jump into Q&A? Yeah, I think this follows the same trends that we've seen when we asked this question previously. I think that um, definitely we have the 
continue the webinar resources, uh, both future and the ones that we have recorded and are available for free on our website. And all the resources that we have can definitely help uh, making sure that uh, folks understand the operating rule requirements. Um, we can also ensure that uh, those resources um, are, are kept up to date too, uh, especially as the technology changes and as um, folks implement and have questions and feedback for us as well. Great. Thanks. Jessica, I'll pass it back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Drew. So we do have a couple of questions that have come in. And if you uh, want to submit a question, uh, please type them into the question channel on the dashboard. Um, so the first question is for either Randy or Mike. And the question is, does PNC data assist health plans with increasing their HEDIS and star rating? Uh, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the PNT data, by reaching out and, and getting the data from those clinical sites, um, in the use cases that we have in the pairs that we work with, they saw a measurable lift in their HEDIS and STAR ratings uh, because it is about data gathering and, and then it's about the metrics in there. Um, so, you know, it really is important to go out and get lots of data because those, as everyone knows, those metrics change, particularly in STAR where the claim data might not be enough to improve your rating and you really need the clinical data as backup to really really provide that measurable lift. So, so the, abs the answer is absolutely yes and that's really the main uh, key metric and, and success factor when we work with a payer on gathering that clinical data. Great and I've got another question for you guys for PNT data and that question is uh, someone would like to know about your enrollment process for their customers. Sure. So, so anybody that would be interested in enrolling can go to pntdata.com forward slash enroll and, and um, enroll uh, directly with us, at which point our um, uh, support team will coordinate uh, their requirements with our sales team. And, your, and your main, just to clarify for, for our audience, your main customers are, are what types of healthcare entities? Sure. Our, our customers are the health plans themselves. Our end users are the providers, labs, hospitals, vendors, etc. Thank you very much for clarifying. Um, I've got a course certification uh, question for Bob. Um, can penalties be assessed against entities that fail to comply with the mandated operating rules? Um, that's a great question. And yes, there is. Um, very specific requirements and penalties for non-conformance with the core operating rules for phases um, one, two, and three. So entities can um, submit complaints to CMS and CMS can conduct their uh, research process and actually assess very specific penalties and fees um, for, I guess I'm going to call it different um, shades of non-compliance. Um, and those can be quite costly, um, uh, you know, up to a million dollars per episode or incident, and that can be multiplied over uh, several times according to how many times that particular incident has occurred. So there's lots of penalties, um, lots of uh, very specific penalties that are available both under HIPAA and HITECH and then also under the ACA for um, specific um, non-compliance for the operating rule. So it's kind of a combination hit there if you're not in conformance with both the standards and the operating rule. Great, and I've got one last question and it's uh, for Bob. Um, the question is, are you able to address implementation costs for large versus small entities? So that's a, another great question. I know that um, the, the costs range quite a bit from a provider that may just be purchasing a core certified solution to um, a large national health plan that may have three, four, or five different um, adjudication systems or eligibility databases that all have to be, rem be remediated. Um, so we, we do have some um, ROI studies that have been conducted for the phase one implementation. And this is a little, a, a few years back now, um, for just phase one, just to give an idea of what the cost savings were. Um, and with the cost, I'm sorry, with the cost for, for implementing the phase one rules for just for eligibility. Um, and so some plans um, were able to recoup, most, I'm sorry, most of the health plans were able to recoup those expenditures for their projects in less than a year's time. 
um, because the, the data that's required for the eligibility content requirements for phase one and two are usually not something that is that difficult for health plan to provide. Again, it's deductibles, co-insurance, in and out of pocket information, so nothing that's uh, too unusual or difficult for a plan to implement. Uh, usually it may be the technology, including the you know, SOAP or MIME requirements for connectivity, um, ensuring that you have the acknowledgments in place. Um, so those can range anywhere. Those implementation projects have quite a range from a small regional plan, say health plan of, of San Francisco, to like a United or an Aetna or a Cigna or Humana. Uh, they can be quite costly. And we do have more information available in that web, on our web about uh, that ROI case study. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, and it looks like we are out of time for today. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us, and a recording of the session will be available on our website in the next 24 hours. We'll send it to you, um, it, um, those of you who registered. Uh, and the next slide is some ways to connect with us. Um, the slide uh, following includes a list of our upcoming webinars. We hope you will join us. And I'd like to point out that for those of you headed out to South Carolina this weekend for the NPAG meeting, um, both Mike and Bob will pre be presenting at that conference, completely different um, presentations. But you know, plan on attending those sessions if you want more information or want to engage with them. Um, and then finally, here are some educational tools that have been recently placed on our website. We hope um, they're useful to you. And if um, they are, please send us your feedback. We're trying to understand how people use this um, and how we can serve you better. Um, and finally, uh, thanks for joining us. You may now disconnect and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.